Good morning, good afternoon, good evening class. Whenever you're deciding to join me and thank you for joining in my English language arts virtual instruction for week two, the week of March 30th, 2020. Last week, week one, I wanted to give you an introduction to our platform and this week we're diving deeper into our academics. The standard we are, oops, went one too many. The standard we are working with this week is RI 2.5, which is for informational text, so that is nonfiction text. Our reading standard for today focuses on being able to analyze in detail how an author's ideas or claims are developed and refined by particular sentences, paragraphs, or larger portions of the text, such as sections or chapters. So basically, our goal is to better understand how an author makes his or her point through specific sections within the text. Here is an overview for this week's lesson. We'll be working with the reading standard RI 2.4 and exploring the text Deep Survival. First, always answer the attendance question for week two. Um, Many of you are answering the attendance question more than once a week. You only have to answer the attendance question once a week. You do not have to stay here every day. Once you answer the question for the week, you are marked present for the week. So please only answer or respond to the attendance thread once a week. Thank you. You have uh, your weekly Achieve article this week. It's called Miracle on the Hudson. You do not have to search for it. It should be the only Achieve article on your home page. Um, and then we will be using our online textbook to read the text Deep Survival and answer and finish our assignment. There are three parts. Part A is the pre-reading activity, part B during reading activity, and part C the post-reading activity. If you do not know how to access your online textbook, please watch the introduction to the platforms video on my YouTube channel. But I will also show you today if you forget how to do it. Um, lastly, you have your weekly independent reading log. I got a lot of questions last week about this. You can pick any book of your choice. It can be a book of your own or you can go on the library's website and read an ebook. You can listen to an audiobook. I do not care. And you just record the title of the book, the author, and the minutes read. You complete that every day. You do not do Achieve article. So one day of the week, you will do your Achieve article, and the other four days of the week, you will complete your independent reading log. I do not want you reading for an hour one day and saying, okay, I did my reading for the week. You need to be reading every day. Okay, so please access week two assignment ELA 9, document in Teams now if you haven't already done so. This week, Teams should be error free, I'm hoping. So I want to um, transition into using only Teams. You will answer, you will complete your assignment in Teams. You will turn it in in Teams. I will grade it and give it back to you in Teams so that we are not um, emailing it and submitting it on focus and all these different things. Please let me know if it's not working and we can find alternative ways to access the assignment. <clears throat> all right, moving forward. Today's focus for our lesson is survival. Just look at the world around us today. We're all in a state of survival and our world is changing rapidly as we fight to stay safe and alive. By definition, survival is the state or fact of continuing to live or exist, typically, typically in spite of an accident or deal or difficult circumstance. I would say the life we are living right now is kind of a difficult cir circumstance we have to survive, yes? Let's take a look at a few incredible acts of survival that we have seen throughout history, which are hard to believe really happened. Check out the YouTube video, 10 Survival Stories That Actually Happened, 
by accessing this link. Sit tight, it's about 13 minutes long. While viewing, imagine each person's mindsets and actions that help them in their fight for survival. What would you have done? Pause this video now and watch the YouTube video, 10 Survival Stories That Actually Happened. All right, let's get ready to knock out our pre-reading activity. Assignment 2A. As you already know, strong readers always activate their background knowledge and make personal connections to any text they read. Access Assignment 2A now and follow along as I read the directions for this activity. Okay. Think about a time in which you witnessed or experienced being in a battle for survival. You may choose to consider an example from the warm-up, the survival YouTube video. What actions or mindsets do you believe led to their, your success in staying alive? Feel free to use bullet points for a quick list or jot down a few sentences. So we're focusing on actions and mindsets that led to success and survival. You can either use a personal story or one you watched from the video. Take about 10 minutes to think through and complete this activity before you jump into the text with me. When you're done, join me back in the slideshow. You may pause here. Welcome back class. Earlier I mentioned that our focus for this week is reading standard RI 2.5, which analyzes an author's ideas or claims. Let's clarify the larger question that we must understand when reading our text, Deep Survival. The essential question is what we must be able to answer by the end of our lesson. Based on the anecdote re anecdotes reference in Lawrence Gonzalez writing Deep Survival, what actions and or mindset does he believe are essential to one's survival? Just as a side note, if you don't know what anecdote means, anecdotes are short stories about an incident or person. So he, he uses a variety of short stories to teach you um, about what you should and should not do to survive. <clears throat> so while we're reading, we should consider certain actions and mindsets that Gonzalez encourages or discourages when one is faced with the fight to stay alive. So what he says to do and not do. Let's access the text. So you go to your, oops. So you go to your Duval County Public Schools website, popular links, blended learning. My HRW, which is the textbook. Sign in. Student ebook. <clears throat> and you can either use your table of contents or you can just click at the top and go to page 325. And here's our text, Deep Survival. Now I'm going to split my screen. Half of it is going to be the text. Oh boy. One moment. Okay, so half of it is going to be our text and half is going to be our assignment. Now I can't see this, so I'm going to make it bigger with my page view.
And I think I'm going to change it to. OK, what happened here? There we go. OK. So now let's locate the graphic organizer that we'll use to help us interact with our essential question. This graphic organizer is actually assignment 2B. Once again, I'm going to make each screen smaller that I can have them side by side, as you see here. Follow along as I read the directions for the activity. While reading Lawrence Gonzalez's Deep Survival on pages 325 to 334, complete the graphic organizer below, taking note of each person's actions and mindsets through the anecdotes provided in the text. In some cases, these actions and mindsets are explicitly stated, while at other times they are implied and require you to make an inference. Include the page and line numbers for your reference as it will be helpful later in complete, completing assignment 2C. So we have Julianne Kopke, Ronald D. Francisco, and victims of the World Trade Center attack, Byron Kearns, and James Stockdale. So these are the people we want to Pay attention to in the text. I will model how to complete this assignment by pulling out a few actions that I recognize uh, Julianne Kopke took in her fight to stay alive. Remember that some actions and mindsets will be stated explicitly while others are implied. Explicit is when it is directly in the text. You can put your hand on it. Implied is when you have to use your brain and figure out what they're trying to tell you, right? One final note before reading, there will be times when Gonzalez shows us what one should not do in the fight for survival, and we want to acknowledge those details as well. Okay, are you ready to start? Let's jump in the text. I'll give you a moment to locate the text. Julianne Kopke was flying with her mother and 90 other passengers on Christmas Eve 1971 when lightning struck, causing an extensive structural failure of the Lockheed Electra. Julianne fell out of the broken airplane into the Peruvian jungle. She was, she was 17 years old, wearing her Catholic confirmation dress and white high heels. Miraculously, she suffered only cuts and a broken collarbone from the crash. Later, she reported feeling a hefty concussion. Then she was falling toward the jungle. As she recalled, I remember thinking that the jungle trees below looked just like cauliflowers. To someone who knows about survival, that statement is telling. She wasn't screaming. She wasn't in a panic. She was in wonder at the world in which she found herself. She was taking it all in touching her new reality, checking the environment while falling. Amazing cool. So that was our first example of what Julianne did to stay alive. She didn't panic when she was falling from a plane crash. So Julianne did not panic um, while falling in plane, planes, plane crash. She kept her cool. And we want to put the lines in which we found that. So it's like Line 10. Eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, lines ten through fourteen. And page three twenty-five. All right, so we'll keep reading. Amazing and also characteristic of a true survival survivor. Bill Garleb, an American GI who survived the Bataan Death March in the Philippines, found his senses increasingly sharp as he experienced a deep wonder at the birds and colors and smells of the jungle. A dozen other passengers survived the midair disintegration of Julianne's plane. And if you don't know a word, so this is disintegration. 
you can click on it and it tells you the um, the definition and you can also listen to how to say disintegration. The process of a whole coming apart into pieces. Um, of Julian's plane and their attitude and hence their behavior and fate were quite different from hers. Julianne awoke alone on the floor of the jungle, still strapped to her seat. There were no sign of her mother, who'd been beside her in the plane. She spent the night trying to keep out of the rain under her seat. The next day, she deduced or no through reason or logic conclusion. Oh, goodness. I did not mean to do that. That even the helicopters and airplanes she could hear wouldn't be able to see her through the jungle canopy. She'd have to get herself out. It was another important moment. She didn't spend time bemoaning her fate. She looked to herself, took responsibility, and made a plan. So the text even tells us this is an important moment in her survival. So we're going to write this down. Julian did not mope about her situation. She took responsibility and made a plan. Took responsibility for her survival, right? That is lines. This is 30, 20, 27 to 29. It's page 326. Okay, moving on. Her parents were researchers who worked in the jungle and she was familiar with the environment, but Julianne had had no survival training. She didn't know where she was or which way she ought to go. But her father had told her that if she went downhill, she'd find water. He said that rivers usually led to civilization. And while the strategy can just as easily lead into a swamp, at least she had a plan that she believed in. She had a task. So it was pretty lucky that Julianne's parents were researchers and taught her this tip. But I think more importantly is that she had a plan and a task. So why don't we add this to our chart? Julianne had a plan and a task to go down hill in search of water that would possibly lead to civilization. This is lines. Thirty-three through thirty-six. And that is page three twenty-six as well. All right, moving on. Meanwhile, the others who had lived through the fall decided to await rescue, which is not necessarily a bad idea either. But expecting someone else to take responsibility for your well-being can be fatal, which means it can result in your death. In Alive, Pierce, Pierce Paul Reed tells the story of the survivors of another plane crash, this one in the Andes. Everyone who survived the crash stayed put, assuming they'd be rescued. Many died. The others wound up eating each other to keep from starving before suddenly fi someone finally walked out and found help. So these people waited for rescue. Some of them died. Some of them had to resort to cannibalism to stay alive. And the only reason any of one got saved is because someone finally decided to walk out of the situation. So I think it's really important that you um, don't always wait for help. Sometimes it might be important to wait for help but you know don't wait so long that you die eventually you need to take the situation into your own hands so why don't we add that to our chart as something that we should not do in order to stay alive don't wait 
for someone else to save you. Lines 33, nope, sorry, lines 37 to 40. And I think I'm probably going to find more, so I'm going to add another um, column to my table. And you should already have this column here because I will make sure this is the version I upload. Julian had nothing except a few pieces of candy and some small cakes. She had no survival equipment, no tools, no compass or map. None of the things I've been taught to use in survival school. But she very deliberately set up a program for herself. She set off, resting through the heat of the day, traveling during cooler periods. She walked for 11 days through the dense jungle while being literally eaten alive by leeches and strange tropical insects, which bored into her laid their eggs and produced worms that hatched and tunneled through her skin. Wow, she really had it rough. Eventually, she came to a hut along the banks of the river she'd been following. She staggered and collapsed inside. There was always a lot of chance involved in survival situations, both good luck and bad. It was Julianne's good fortune that three hunters turned up the next day and delivered her to a local doctor. But as Louise Pasteur said, luck favors the prepared mind. Tough and clear-headed, this teenage girl who had lost her shoes, not to mention her mother, on the first day saved herself. The other survivors took the same 11 days to sit down and die. The forces that put them there were beyond their control, but the course of events for those who found themselves alive on the ground were the result of deep and personal individual reactions to a new environment. So this is telling us the fate of the other 11 people um, was much different than Julianne's. She was able to live and all of the other ones died, right? Um, I don't really see anything I want to add, so I guess we'll just have these four. The naughtiest mystery of survival is how one is equipped, ill-prepared, oh, how one unequipped, ill-prepared 17-year-old girl gets out alive, and a dozen adults in similar circumstances better equipped do not. But the deeper I've gone into the study of survival, the more si sense such outcomes make. Making fire, building shelter, finding food, signaling navigation, none of that mattered to Julian's survival. Although we cannot know what the others who survived the fall were thinking and deciding, it's possible that they were that they knew they were supposed to stay put in a weight rescue. They were rule followers and it killed them. So maybe that's something we add. Sometimes we don't always want to follow the rules. because it can lead to our death, right? So I'm going to put Julian. How do we sell this person's name? Julian was not a rule follower. And because of that, she survived. Lines 96 through 97, page 326. Oh, sorry, that's 75 and 76.
In the World Trade Center disaster, many people who were used to following the rules died because they did what they were told to by authority figures. An employee of the Aon Insurance Company on the 93rd floor of the South Tower had begun his escape, but returned to his office after the security guards made a general announcement that the building was safe and that people should stay inside until they were told to leave. Before he died, he spoke to his father on the phone. Why did I listen to them? I shouldn't have. Another man, an employee of Fuji Bank, actually reached the ground floor of the lobby, only to be sent back in by a security guard. A third worker called a family a third worker called a family member and recorded a final message on the answering machine. I can't go anywhere because they told us not to move. I have to wait for the firefighters. And thinking for herself, Julianne wasn't even particularly brave. Survival is not about bravery and heroics. Heroes can be perfect heroes and wind up dead. By definition, survivors must live. Julianne was afraid most of the time of everything from piranhas when she had to wade in the water to worms that were crawling around under her skin to the real or imagined creatures of the forbers. Survivors aren't fearless. They use fear. They turn it into anger and focus. So this line tells me that Julianne used her fear and turned it into something else. Focus. I will add this to my graphic organizer because this shows she took action. So Julianne turned her fear into focus. Lines 96 through 97. What happened here? Okay, I have filled up my graphic organizer for Julianne Kopke. I will continue reading out loud, but your task is to complete the rest of the people mentioned in the text. When you come across an action or mindset that you feel relates to survival, pause this video and add it to your graphic organizer. Okay, let's continue with the text. Um, I do want to mention the next one is Ronald DeFresco and victims of the World Trade Center attacks. And it does talk about the World Trade Center in the last paragraph. So I don't know, maybe you want to add that to your graphic organizer. I would if I was completing this assignment. So remember that we want to focus on what people did do to survive and then what people might have done wrong, which led to their death. So reread that paragraph right here about the World Trade Center and think about if they did the right thing or the wrong thing to stay alive. And I want you to add it to your first box for the victims of the World Trade Center attack. Okay, we're gonna move on. <clears throat> Conversely, searchers are always amazed to find people who have died while in possession of everything they needed to survive. John Leach writes that, Victims have been recovered from life rafts with a survival box containing flares, rations, first aid kits, and so on, unopened and the necessary contents unused. Some people just give up, Ken Hill told me, referring to his search and rescue operations in Nova Scotia. Fifteen years I've been studying this and I can't figure out why. What saved Julianne was an inner resource, a state of mind. She certainly didn't have the physical equipment but she'd been, use this, <clears throat> prepared mentally somehow. A lifetime of experience shapes us to meet or be crushed by such challenges as a bad divorce, the shattering of a career, a terrible illness or accident, a collapsing economy, a war, prison camp, the death of a loved one, or being stranded in the jungle. I went to survival school to try to understand the mystery and see if I could master my own journey. So here, Gonzalez mentions other things than a freak accident that um, might be something we have to survive. Bad divorce, terrible illness or accident, collapsing economy. So right now we're going through this COVID-19 quarantine. Everything's been shut down. And you might feel a little isolated at the moment. So maybe some of these tips can help you um, get through. 
And um, just know that this is out of our control and we just have to have the right attitude, right? All right, moving on. So now he's going to talk about his own journey in survival school. We took off from Pittsfield, Massachusetts, sharing the flying duties and landed in Lynchburg, Virginia. As I climbed out of the cockpit and onto the wing, I caught my first glimpse of our instruction instructor, Byron Kearns. So that's that guy's on our list too. So whenever he's talking about Byron Kearns, we want to pay attention. Byron Kearns runs the Mountain Shepherd Survival School. He swaggered across the fueling ramp toward us wearing an 18-inch Panamanian machete on his belt. A big, macho-looking guy with 12 years of military experience, including a stint with the Marines. He had worked at the famous Air Force Survival School in Washington State. When I saw him, I thought, we're in for it now. That night, Byron explained that we were going to head off into the Virginia woods the next morning, early, and we'd be drilling for several days on such matters as map and compass work, firecraft, shelter, and signaling. We'd learn to find water or distill it from the air. We would not think about food because it wasn't necessary. The Air Force plan was that you'd be found within three days. Your job, he said, is to stay alive for 72 hours. When he left, Jonas said, this guy's going to whip you like a redheaded stepchild. Okay, well, I don't know how PC that is. Early the next morning, as we moved up the Rocky River drainage through the mountains, I noticed that Kearns would stop frequently to point out something of beauty or interest. He spoke softly as if we were in church. He laughed a lot. He liked to be still and just think or smoke a cigarette. I saw no sign of the drill sergeant I'd expected. In our first exercise, Kearns asked me and Jonas to make a fire. And in a matter of minutes, we had a roaring blaze going. Kearns had turned away to get something from his pack. When he turned back, the flames were leaping several feet off the ground. Whoa, he said, laughing. Easy, easy. I just wanted to know if you could start a fire. Some people can't. Then he gently separated the pile of wood and put it out. Byron Kearns turned out to be a soft-spoken, polite, cheerfully earnest, and gentle to a fault. He moved slowly, never hurried, and was always carefully assessing himself and his environment. He wasn't prone to high emotional states. He carried with him contagious air of calm. He reminded me of my father, actually. Like so many retired pilots, my father wore soft shoes, talked softly, and walked slowly. As a pilot, you want to wear soft shoes so that you can feel the rudder pedals. You don't want to make sudden, unplanned motions in a combat aircraft cockpit, where the controls are sensitive and lots of things can explode. The demeanor, or attitude, or perceived behavior, once learned under penalty of death, is carried through the rest of your life. Kearns also had that quiet, dark, and private humor. Even after a lifetime in the wilderness, Kearns entered the woods with a deep sense of respect and humility, like a man approaching a magnificent, dangerous, and unpredictable creature. It's the same way a good pilot approaches his aircraft. As we walked in the wilderness learning technical skills, Kearns kept talking about positive mental attitude, it was the number one item on his checklist he'd given us, and that checklist was from the big daddy of all checklist writers, the U.S. Air Force. Positive mental attitude. <clears throat> so we've read quite a bit about Byron Kearns in these last couple of pages. I want you to think about any actions or mindsets that he might have that would lead to his survival success. So take a minute to, to copy those down. <clears throat> it must be important, I told Jonas. Yeah, but what is it, he asked. Think good thoughts and you'll be saved? I'd rather have a chainsaw and a cheeseburger, Jonas said. A cell phone and a GPS would be nice, too. So these people are doubting the um, impactfulness of a positive mental attitude. I personally think it can go a long way. 
All right, moving on. As we slodged through the woods, practicing firecraft, shelter making, not to navigation, I kept asking Kearns, but he couldn't explain it. Nobody could. It meant the difference between life and death. He could tell me that. He had an adult portion of it. He assured me on that. It's not what's in your pack, he'd say. It's what's in here. He'd tap his chest. No wonder Tom Wolfe had called it the right stuff. He couldn't exactly title a book Positive Mental Attitude now, could you? So here he even mentions that positive mental attitude could be the difference between life or death. So maybe it's important to add to your graphic organizer. I don't know. That's just me. <clears throat> All right. Kearns didn't always have it, though. He had acquired it. Early on in his Air Force days, he took a group of pilots into the mountains near Spokane for survival training maneuvers. I was a greenhorn, which means a newbie and just misjudged our situation, he told us. Back then, he was pretending to be the macho drill instructor, I, instructor I'd expected. Go, 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 push, push, push. He was not yet cool, he was acting cool. His class had been crossing a vast field of slushy snow, which made the going rough. The pilots began to suffer from fatigue, but Curtins kept driving them. I now realize that was a mistake, he said. As the temperature dropped, darkness came down like a curtain. Suddenly, everybody wanted to give up. They just sat down and lost all their will. Apathy is a typical reaction to any sort of disaster. And if you're exhausted in a field of snow at sundown in the mountains, you're pretty much about to witness the simple disaster of nature separating you permanently from everything you know and love in the world. That apathy can rapidly lead to complete psychological deterioration. Then you sit down and hypothermia sets in, which produce, produces more apathy, a more profound psychological deterioration, and ultimately death. Fatigue almost always comes as a surprise. It is as much a psychological condition as a physical one, and scientists have struggled without success to understand it. It's like the difficulty of studying sand in order to understand the sand pile effect. There's nothing in the muscles or nerves or even the biochemistry of the body that would seem to predict or expect fatigue. Once fatigue sets in though, it is almost impossible to recover from it under survival conditions. It is not just a matter of being tired. It's more like a spiritual collapse and recovery requires more than food and rest. <clears throat> so these last couple paragraphs talk about how fatigue is a big part of um, weakening your chances of survival. And we're talking about fire and kerns. So this is an example of what not to do in order to survive. And I would add it to my graphic organizer. Um, and I would also consider fatigue during this time. <clears throat> you're not, you're probably not doing very much right now. Um, cause you're forced to stay at home, but you might feel unusually tired and it might just be because mentally the the situation you're in is fatiguing you and you know it's going to take more than just food and rest to get you out of this mental state or spiritual collapse so you know this is why they say self-care is so important so make sure you're taking care of yourself all right Following the explosive burst of activity that is sometimes required for survival or in the panic stage when you're running or climbing or swimming, you're like a woman, who, woman who's just given birth to a baby. You're depleted and wide open to fatigue. It may take weeks to recover, and if you're not taking care of yourself, that fatigue can lead into an inability to sleep, which in turn can result in a sudden psychological collapse. The physical and psychological factors rapidly erode each other which means they quickly um, make each other worse. Which is why it's so important to pace yourself. Rest frequently and stay hydrated.
All right. Survival situation is a ticking. Only so much stored energy. Time yourself, you're using it up. The trick is to be extremely stingy with your scarce resources, balancing risk and reward, investing only in the efforts that offer the biggest return. In survival situations, people greatly underestimate the need for rest. While Kearns, Jonas, and I were doing map and compass exercises, he would frequently stop and look around at the woods, chatting with us. I'd be thinking, let's go, let's go, I know the way. And he'd just stand there. Now I understand why. You should operate at about 60% of your normal level activity, he explained, and, the re and rest and rehydrate frequently. If the weather is cool and you're sweating, you're working too hard. So this is more advice from Byron Kearns, and I would add it to your graphic organizer. When Kearns at last realized how serious his situation was with his fatigued Air Force pilots, he recounted, I fell to my knees and I prayed. Faith is very important thing in your will to survive. As Peter Leszek put it, whether a deity is actually listening or not, there is value in formally announcing your needs and desires, worries and sins, and goals in a focused, prayful attitude. Only when you are aware can you take action. Survival psychologists have observed the same thing. <clears throat> so here's two more pieces of advice for survival. Faith is a very important thing in your will to survive. And whether a deity is actually listening or not, there is value in formally announcing your needs, desires, worries, sins, and goals in a focused, prayful attitude. So even if you're a non-religious person, um, putting your will out into the universe makes a big difference. So I wanted you to add these two things to the Byron Kearns part of your graphic organizer. Kearns added, all at once it hit me that I might actually lose them. Those million dollar pilots could die. By chance, he found a fence and used the cedar post to start a fire. Chance is nothing more than opportunity and it's all around at every turn. The trick lies in recognizing it. It's amazing to see what fire can do. You're out in the woods, you're cold, you're lost, and you're lonely. But the minute you light that fire in your home, the lights are on and supper's cooking. It made a world of difference going from complete darkness to light and warmth. It just turned everybody around. Kearns learned many lessons that night. His mastery and confidence turned the pilots around even more than that fire. It showed them the way, and it made Kearns more able to save himself. That lesson was driven home again and again. Helping someone else is the best way to ensure your own survival. It takes you out of, <clears throat> out of yourself. It helps you rise above your fears. Now you're a rescuer, not a victim. And seeing how your leadership and skill buoy others up gives you more focus and energy to per persevere, which means to keep going. The cycle reinforces itself. You buoy them up and their response buoys you up. Many people who survive alone report they were doing it for someone else, a wife, boyfriend, mother, back home. When Antony de Saint Expiry was lost in the Liberian desert, it was the thought of his wife's suffering that kept him going. <clears throat> so there's another piece of advice to stay alive. Helping someone else is the best way to ensure your own survival. So make sure you add that to your graphic organizer. In the 84th floor office of the World Trade Center South Tower, so we're back on the World Trade Center, and an hour before the collapse, Ronald DeFrancesco was one of the people who met Brian Clark, the fire warren with a flashlight who was asking people up or down. DeFrancesco went up, hoping to find air, but after 10 or so floors, he encountered, encountered people who were succumbing to fatigue and smoke. The people, all of whom would die, were just giving up and falling asleep. Dean Francesco, too, was collapsing. But then he said to himself, I got to see my wife and kids again. And with that, he got up and bolted down the stairs safely. So if you don't have enough room to add it to Brian Kearns, you can add um, this detail to 
Ronald D. Francisco. <clears throat> Doctors and nurse nurses often survive better than others because they have someone to help. They have a well-defined purpose. Purpose is a big part of survival, but it must be accompanied by work. Grace without good works is not salvation. The survivors plan by setting small manageable goals and then systematically achieving them. Hence the Air Force checklist and the notion which my father drilled into me, plan the flight and fly the plan, but don't fall in love with the plan, be open to changing world and let go of the plan when necessary so that you can make a new plan. Then, as the world and the plan both go through the books of changes, you will always be ready to do the next right thing. So, stick with the plan of virtual school, but know that it might change, right? People are animals with animal instincts, but they lack many of the other survival mechanisms animals possess, such as fur to keep them warm, fangs and claws, and flight or speed. Culture creates a collective survival mechanism for the species. People survive better in numbers. They survive because they use cognition to organize, say for a hunt and to make things. Even as cognition inhibits their animalness, including strength. That's why when cognition is turned off, people are amazed by their own strength because cognition continuously inhibits us or holds us back. That is the whole secret to cognition. It is a mechanism for modulating emotion emotional, physical responses. Every culture evolves survival rituals. Some especially non-technical ones are devoted to not so much more than survival. In Native American cultures, one ritual is the vision quest in which a young person goes into the wild and fasts in search of a vision. It can be seen as a type of survival training for there is no food, no water, no way. A person has already practiced sitting still and making the best of their situation. He'll have the confidence in his abilities to survive. The survival lessons that apply today are ancient. The Tao Te Ching is broken into two parts, integrity and the way, which can be thought of as two halves of surviving anything. Lao Tzu's book is a handbook for a ruler, but it's also a handbook for the brain. An imbalances and imbalance of the brain's function leads us into trouble, and a triumph of the balance gets us out. I found similar lessons in Epictetus, Herodotus, Thucydides, the Bible, the Bhagavad Gita. <clears throat> is there anything whereof it may be said? See, this is new, says Ecclesiastes. But there are always new people who haven't heard that there's nothing new under the sun. And there's always someone who doesn't get the word. So this was a very wordy paragraph. And it's basically saying these rules for survival, um, talking about how your brain must be in balance, are found in all sorts of cultures. This is Indian. This is the Bible, which most of us know. Um, Greek philosophers and so on. So this is, these ideas are not new. He's just presenting them in a different way. They've been around for centuries, right? All right, moving on. I have always wondered where our American survival rituals were. I think now that they're everywhere around us. The Boy Scouts in its original conception was a survival school. Sports are survival training in that they teach strength, agility, strategy, and the endurance of pain. But our culture is filled with survival stories as well. Just like the video you watched in the beginning. Cool is the ultimate American conception of the survival model. James Stockdale, so this is our last guy, so we want to pay attention to the actions and mindset he has to stay alive. James Stockdale, a fighter pilot who was shot down over Vietnam in 1965, spoke many times about how he survived seven and a half years in a prison camp. One should include a course of familiarization with pain, he said. Stockdale observed, you have to practice hurting. There is no question about it. You have to practice being hazed. You have to learn to take a bunch of junk and accept it with a sense of humor. So that's his advice for staying alive. 
And I want you to add that to your graphic organizer. So you have to practice hurting. You have to practice being hazed. You have to learn to take a bunch of dunk, junk and accept it with a sense of humor. So try to keep that attitude right now, right? He's talking about being cool, just as he was when his F-8 fighter bomber was hit with a 57 millimeter fire. He had been on a relaxed bomb run at the time. He'd even taken off his uncomfortable oxygen mask. I could barely keep the plane from flying into the ground while I got the damn oxygen mask to my mouth so I could tell my wingman that I was about to eject. What rotten luck. And on my milk run. My mind was clear, and I said to myself, five years. I knew we were making a mess of the war in Southeast Asia, but I didn't think it would last longer than that. The Spartan practice of enduring the bite of the fox is a course of familiarization with pain. Then there are schools like Kearns, which attempt to teach wilderness survival by directly meeting the problem head on with Yankee ingenuity. So he said he would give himself five years. He knew he could withstand whatever came for five, at least five years, right? So you want to add that to your graphic organizer. Like being lost, survival is transformation. Being a leader can ensure that when you reach the final stage of that metamorphosis, it is with an attitude of commitment, not resignation. The transformation of survival is permanent. People who have had the experience often go on to become the best search and rescue professionals. They have come to understand, perhaps unconsciously, that they can only live fully by helping others through the same transformation. All the survivors I talked to have told me how horrible the experience was, but they have also told me often, with deep puzzlement, how beautiful it was. They wouldn't trade the experience for anything in the world. It gradually dawned on me that only by researching and dissecting the mysterious quality the Air Force so dully called positive mental attitude would I ever understand survival. And I thought, wait a minute. My father was in the Army Air Corps. Maybe that's what he had that allowed him to live. If so, he'd certainly never talked about it. But what pilot would? I thought as if I stepped to the edge of a very thing I'd been after my all my life. Here, concealed in the most unimaginative phrase possible, was the deep mystery I've been trying to unravel. <clears throat> so that was the text. Hopefully you were able to write down the mindset and actions that these four characters um, used in order to survive or not survive, right? So um, now that our graphic organizer is complete, we're going to go to assignment 2C, the post reading activity. Follow along as I read the directions. Based on reading Deep Survival by Lawrence Gonzalez, what is his definition of survival? Use at least two examples from different anecdotes in the text. So two of the stories that you put in your graphic organizer, you're going to want to use to answer the essential question. To support your analysis, be sure to explain how each anecdote shapes Gonzalez's definition of survival. You're encouraged to utilize your graphic organizer to, cons to assist in crafting your response. So instead of using Rassisi's, we're going to, oh, we are using two, Never mind. So we're going to use Rassisi's, make sure Use your CCs to answer the essential question. Your thoroughly written paragraph should be approximately 10 to 12 sentences. You don't have to label the sentences or separate them into chunks like the model shows. So please keep it as one paragraph. Keep it all thoughtfully crafted um, into one coherent paragraph. This assignment should take approximately 20 to 30 minutes to complete. So you're taking 20 to 30 minutes to do this essential question. Please take your time and answer it thoughtfully. Um, if you have effectively completed part 2B while reading, good luck. When in doubt, refer to your guide and think back to all of our practice while we were on campus before spring break. If you need further assistance in developing strong writing, please don't hesitate to reach out to me during the daily virtual meeting. And I don't want to um, limit you to using only two pieces of evidence from the text. If you have another um, anecdote you'd like to use, you can go ahead and add it 
as well. Just remember to explain its significance. Okay, so the end of the lesson is the reading log. Please make sure you're reading at least 20 to 30 minutes per day and you are logging under assignment 2D. So that's right here. I really appreciate you engaging in our virtual classroom this week. Don't forget this assignment will be due on Friday, April 3rd, 2020. Stay tuned for our next lesson, which, be, which will be available to you on each Monday. Have a great rest of your week and stay safe out there. Much love.